Welcome to section for S75. This is uh, July 18th, Wednesday evening. We're going to be talking about JavaScript this evening and about jQuery and about the document object model. So as always with my, my sections, um, my name's uh, Meyer, and I'm one of the TFs for S75. You can find the code that I talk through tonight at github.com slash codekiln slash s75 sections. And if you just go to that URL and then scroll down, there are instructions on how to view the code in the CS50 appliance so that it appears for you like it does for me right here. This is the CS50 appliance over to the right. So first, since we're at this page, I'd like to point out a few new links for this week. Um, I've put in uh, some links to some JavaScript videos by Douglas Crockford. Each one of these is about an hour long, so uh, you probably don't have enough time to watch it before next week, but um, all of these are great. Uh, I have a bit here about JSLint, specifically about how to install it. Uh, David talked about that about at the end of class, and we're going to go through a little bit of that this evening as well. Finally, there are some links to JavaScript documentation generation in the spirit of Javadoc or, uh, or like PHP's uh, documentation generation capabilities. Um, and finally, there's uh, a link to JS Fiddle, which is uh, a great place to test uh, JavaScript online. Up in the left-hand quadrant here, you see the HTML that the JavaScript operates on. And here in the lower left quadrant, you see the JavaScript that you're able to do. In the upper right quadrant, you are able to enter in CSS. And then the result appears in the lower right-hand window. And you can even link to your specific example with JS Fiddle. So, I highly encourage you to uh, mess around with JS Fiddle when you're thinking about a user interface prototype uh, for one of your assignments. Uh, maybe you can mock it up here, and then once the interface details are kind of flushed out, you can move it into production mode. So uh, this evening, uh, we'll be working through the July 18th code, which is right here. Um, so I'm going to change directories into July 18th. And um, let me just get it up here. So tonight, the first example I wanted to run through is uh, a quick example of how to make PHP recurs through the directory tree beneath the directory that the file that houses a, a certain PHP code is in and print out the results of the directory tree. Um, in a sense, that's what Apache does for us right here, except they don't expand the subnodes automatically. You actually have to go to another page in order to get the listings of the subdirectory. Um, so here's our first example. You'll see I've structured the folders a little bit differently because uh, in our assignments, we're now putting the index.php, that is the point of entry into the application, in the HTML directory. And so we have to step into the HTML directory in order to see the result. So when we step in, you can see that uh, these are all the files uh, that are inside of the folders, uh, private PHP and HTML. If I go back, and go into private underscore PHP, you'll see those files available. Um, so I did this structure in order to uh, give a simple example of what David was talking about. David mentioned that we want one directory that houses all of the public facing files, all of the files that are chmodded 644 world readable, and then the single index.php that's the entry point into your application. And then from there, including all of the other business logic that is stored in a separate folder that uh, maintaining that separation makes it easier to make sure that your business logic, which is private to you and private to the, your, the business you're representing, if you happen to be working for a client, making sure that that 
business information is actually kept private in case you flip one line of code in httpd.conf or php.ini that actually spits out all the PHP to the screen as text rather than processing it. Um, so if I uh, use the tree command, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's installed here. Uh, you can see the directory structure mimicked like how it is here. This tree command is kind of the inspiration for this little application. Um, if I step inside HTML index.php, you'll see that I basically set some constants and then include the controller. Uh, and the controller calls the model, sets a few configuration variables, and then calls the view. So let's just take a look at the view. Or actually, let's take a look at the uh, model. Um, inside model.php is two functions, php file tree and php file tree dir. Um, and both of these functions um, are the functions that recurs through the subdirectories and generate the HTML that is seen here. If I do view page sort or a view page source, uh, the way that it generates an unordered list with a list item and then a link, and then the, it closes the unordered list uh, for HTML. Um, all of that HTML is generated inside th this function. Uh, and it's, it calls itself recursively. I'm not going to walk through this because we have a lot of JavaScript to get through tonight. Um, but this is an example of some business logic that would be private from the client that is uh, kept in a separate folder from the point of entry into your application. Um, so this is how it looks without JavaScript. Um, and the next version, We'll add some JavaScript so that it only shows the directories, and then we'll be able to click into those directories and just see the files. So let me go into 01. We'll go into 01 here as well. If we go into the HTML directory, now we see an HTML folder and a private, uh, private underscore PHP folder. And if we click that, it expands. And um, if we go into the HTML directory, this is the directory that's supposed to house all of the world readable files. So we see we have a JavaScript folder. If I had styling in here, I would put it inside a CSS folder. If I had images, I would put it inside an image folder inside this public folder. Um, I'm going to change directory into JavaScript and um, look at main.js. And And inside the view, um, I echo out the directory that the JavaScript is kept in. And, and this is the style for including a JavaScript. David probably went over this in the lecture. Um, you say script and then src equals and then the URL to the uh, JavaScript file. The JavaScript file has to be chmodded 604 at least so that that last byte has that world re readable permissions. And for legacy reasons, uh, we don't self-close this tag. Instead, we close the script tag and then put a, a closing tag after it. That just ensures that it, it loads. Um, and we know that this is loading because uh, this functionality is here. So let's take a look at the, at the JavaScript.
So we have one function, init php file tree, and that function spans pretty much the entire document. And then down at the bottom, we have window.onload equals init php file tree. So in this file, what we do is uh, generate a function and uh, de or declare a function and then set that function to be executed when uh, the Windows onload uh, handler files. So this evening we're going to talk about the document object model. Um, the document object model is a, uh, a model inside the browser of the page's content. And the, the content of the document object model, you can think of it in your head like the HTML file. It's a hierarchy of uh, parent-child nodes. And uh, it really just rec uh, it, in, in the document object model, uh, the HTML content is an object, and the body section is another object. And then each one of these objects has properties. And the properties uh, include placeholders for events to happen. And one of the most important uh, document objects is the window object, which is JavaScript's representation of the window that houses the web page. And that window, like many of these elements, has an onload uh, an onload uh, property that you are able to set equal to a function. And if you set it equal to a function, then when the onload event occurs, in this case, when the window is loaded, then whatever function is stored inside that onload property will be executed. And uh, it's up to the browser manufacturer to make sure that uh, that function, the onload function, is is uh, the function stored in the onload property is uh, called at the right time. And you would have to uh, look at the documentation um, of the DOM in order to find out what those properties are. Um, s some other properties that various elements have are uh, on click. Um, and if you store a function inside an on click property of a document object, um, such as an A element, then you can have that function executed when that A element is clicked. Um, so if we go into this just a little bit more, um, we can see our second document I, our second document object. Th this is the global document object. Um, which is the object that represents the entire HTML document. And um, it, has a, uh, it has a function, get elements by tag name. Um, what that function does is make it so that you can get a list, uh, technically an array, of all of the list item elements. So what this is finding here is, I uh, all of the li elements as an array. So now a menus, the variable, has all of the list item elements. And you'll recall that we encoded all of these files as list items. So when, um, when we get all of the elements by tag name uh, for list items, it's getting this item and this item and this item. If we press Control shift c in Chrome, you can see that this is a list item and this is a list item. And now inside A menus is an array of the document objects representing 
this node and this node and uh, this node and this node. Um, and every array has a property called length, and you can iterate through it. And um, th you another property that document objects have is the class name property. The class name property contains um, all of the uh, class names. You'll see in here, here's a list item that has an attribute class equal to pft hyphen file and also a class name equal to ext hyphen php. And um, so in, in this line, we can uh, retrieve an array of all of the classes um, for the document object. And if the class uh, begins with PFT directory, um, and this is something that's leveraging off of what the PHP function does, it creates a um, UL, um, it, it creates an li uh, element that is annotated PFT directory if it is the name of a directory. And so that logic, uh, that data is encoded here into the, the uh, HTML, and we're able to extract that data with this statement. The index of command is a, is, uh, uh, a function that returns the index of a substring inside another string. Um, so, for instance, um, in the word string, substring, I uh, index of string would be uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, because this substring appears here starting at character 3. And it returns negative 1 if the substring is not found in the string. So um, what this is detecting is uh, the following logic will only be executed if the uh, class name begins with the directory. So now we're going to handle the directory. And in the directory, we will get the child nodes. Here's another document object property. Um, the child nodes document object property contains a reference to an array that contains all of the child nodes of the current node. So in this case, uh, actually maybe it would be easier on the screen. Um, if you look here at the screen, list item class equals PFT directory. That is uh, what, in, inside this list item, um, the, the, the list item class equals PFT directory is uh, the, uh, is a menus underscore I. And we're going to get the child nodes of this. And as you can see how it indents, it's going to return an array of references to all of its direct children. Um, and uh, uh, again, arrays have a length property. Um, so you're able to iterate through until the end of the array. Um, so uh, when you're getting to know JavaScript and getting to know the document object, you'll pick up a few of these uh, property names along the way. And then once you've learned a few, you'll have a good handle on, um, on what uh, API the document object model exposes to you. Um, here we get all of the submenus with tag name equals A. Tag name 
is the actual name of the element. So here's an A element, an anchor element. And so now we're going to handle this anchor element and set the onClick property of that equal to a function. Now here in JavaScript, we have an anonymous function. The function is declared right here inside the loop. We have function, and that function goes all the way to here. Let me highlight it. That's the entire function that is then stored inside the onClick of the submenu. Um, and because in JavaScript, functions are first, uh, are first class uh, citizens, they're, 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 uh, functions are uh, first class data in JavaScript, which means that they can be passed into a function, returned from a function. Um, in here, we're storing a function inside of a variable, and that variable is a, is a, or is a property of whatever object is inside the array submenu j. So submenu is, a, is an array of objects. We have one of those objects currently in memory, and we're putting inside a property of that object a function that will be executed at a particular time that is arranged by the browser. And onClick happens when you click on it. And uh, so I, I'm not going to go through all of the code line by line, but basically what that does is make it so that when you click on the files themselves, it gives you an alert that actually uh, tells you the name of the file itself. Um, the, uh, and inside each of these um, document objects, uh, in, in this case, it's uh, an anchor object, there is an onclick property. And inside each of those onclick properties, this is a reference to this function. Um, so I, th I think we've kind of establish the basic point here. Um, so let's retreat out a little bit. Um, so um, when you're writing JavaScript, uh, it's important to be stylistically consistent. Uh, JavaScript is a language that was made in a hurry. It was made uh, in a very short period of time during browser wars between Netscape and Internet Explorer. And it, the browsers were trying to one-up each other. And uh, it was developed during a very short period of time. Uh, and so as a result, there are a lot of good things in JavaScript, but there are also a lot of bad things. Um, and uh, the the bad things are not uh, useless, but they're, they're things that lead to dirty code. Um, so at the beginning of the section, I talked about these videos by, by Douglas Crockford. He is um, a JavaScript guru that was around at the time that JavaScript was first blossoming onto the stage. And he was one of the early players in that, in that space. And um, Douglas Crockford uh, is, I guess, most famous for having uh, invented and uh, one could say maybe not invented, but popularized the JSON uh, JavaScript object notation data format that we're going to use later in this uh, in this course. And um, uh, Douglas Crockford is somebody who's programmed in a lot of languages, and he understands a lot about um, the interaction between coding style and um, a predisposition for errors to creep into the code. And with that in mind, he wrote this tool originally as a stylistic enforcer for writing good JavaScript code uh, that would teach you uh, and enforce in your own code these certain uh, best practices with JavaScript. Um, stuff that's written with JSLint doesn't necessarily run faster. It's just um, Cleaner, easier to maintain, and in general, um, more uh, it it uh, tends to reduce the probability that bugs 
are difficult to, uh, to see for predictable reasons. Um, so uh, it's most often used online because it's a tool that's written in JavaScript. You can paste some JavaScript right into here and then lint it. In fact, um, if we go back into JavaScript and um, let's see if it opens up. So if you copy it into here and press JS lint, then you'll see a list of all the stylistic things that you could have done differently. Um, and I highly encourage you to um, refactor your code with this in order to learn uh, from Douglas Crockford's experience. Um, he is very idiosyncratic and he has a certain way that he likes things coded, and that way is not necessarily the best way. Um, but he is somebody certainly who has a lot of experience in this space, and it can't hurt a JavaScript developer to know about uh, Douglas Crockford's highly influential style in this space. Um, so you can certainly correct it here in the browser by pasting it into this display and then clicking JS Lint. Or um, you can integrate it into your uh, actual command line here. Um, I've included some instructions here for installing it in the appliance. Um, once you install it in the appliance, then you can do jslint main.js, and it gives you those same errors that are right here at the command line. And because it's in such a predictable format, and because people have been writing code on the command line for years, there is a syntax called error format that is used to help parse the output of these linters. Uh, a linter is a tool that helps you analyze your code and see if you can improve certain things about it. And um, it goes all the way back to C. There were linters for C. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, if you know the error format, you can write um, a little script for Vim, the editor, that will read uh, through the document and let you process it all in one place. So I'm going to copy main to um, main2.js and just open up that. And because I have error format installed, um, I can press F4 and you can see it jumps to the first error, which is on line 33, column 3. So I can go 33, capital G, and then go to column 3 right here. It puts your cursor right there. And it says, missing use of use strict statement. So at this point, if I was curious about what that meant, I could say use strict JS lint. And usually a Stack Overflow thing comes up. You can see 619 people have found this useful. And um, so basically, you have to put the phrase use strict somewhere in your code. And, and uh, you can read through here in order to figure out why. Um, the basic uh, answer is that there are many different uh, versions of JavaScript. And for backwards compatibility reasons, when they made new versions of JavaScript, uh, they didn't want to deprecate certain features that were a bad idea because it would break code. Um, so if you do use script or use strict, then it um, deprecates certain things and makes available certain things. And uh, so let's uh, go up here to the top and just um, put um, use strict. And now I'm going to press F4 again. Oops. And that error has gone away, and now we've moved on to the next one. It says, expected if at column 5, not column 3. Oh, well, he wants us to indent in a certain way. So I'm going to make it go. Now you can see right here I'm at column 5, not column 3. Press F4 again. 
And it says, document was used before it was defined. So again, you could Google this. Document used before defined JSLint. And um, in general, when you have a uh, global variable, global variables are very problematic in JavaScript because on one page, you can have not only the page author's JavaScript code running, but maybe an ad running that is loaded dynamically through a content uh, distribution network where the person who wrote the JavaScript doesn't even know what page it's running on. And because there, are, there is the capability for global variables to exist in JavaScript, if, if you make an, a variable called foo in, um, in your uh, JS file, and then in an add.js file, they, unbeknownst to you, also make a ver foo, then whichever one is, is located lower on the page when it's actually loaded will clobber the earlier version of, of the variable. So this is very problematic in JavaScript. It's one of the, not the good parts of JavaScript, but one of the bad parts. And to mitigate that, um, he wants us to acknowledge in the code that this is a global variable by putting in this global directive. Basically, um, what he's suggesting here is that every single global variable, you should acknowledge that it is global and that it could be, um, it could be clobbered. So if I uh, press F4 again, it says document, let me see. Uh, oh yeah, you have to say global global document. And it says uh, document was used before it was defined. So if I do ver document, then <coughs> now I can go on. Um, it says expected uh, a left brace and instead saw return. So here he's saying you need to insert a right brace. And basically what he's suggesting is that it's bad coding practice to not use these braces with ifs um, because it, it lets bugs uh, go into your uh, code more easily. Um, so now it says expected var at column five, not column three. I'll make it go to column five. Combine this with previous var statement. So in, um, <coughs> in JavaScript, you can declare all your variables at once. And then we're going to get, <coughs> it says the four is expected at column five. So basically they want one, two, three, four spaces for each indent. And you can guess that this variable and this variable as well um, are also going to come up. We're going to need to insert I, M class, all of our variables here at the top. So um, if you move all the way out and complete the cycle, um, If I press F4 here, you can see it just returns. I'm completed with linting this. And um, I've, uh, you can see that all the variables are defined at the top of the function. Um, here's a global document directive for the global document object. Here's another function. And this one is pretty different Th th this is a, a pretty significant departure from the previous, uh, from the previous version. Um, let me just open that one up side by side. Uh, 
So before, you'll note that we looped through, and inside the loop, we um, declared an anonymous function that was put inside the onClick handler for, here it is, yeah, submenu j.tagName equals a, then submenu j.onclick equals function. And then here's this huge function. Well, this is very problematic, and it leads to bugs, especially with event handling, um, because we're storing a separate function in every single uh, in every single element of that array, um, even when JavaScript has the ability to store a function in an object like this, submenu onclick func equals function, and then here is that same code, goes all the way down to there, and now we begin looping through, and um, now it's reduced to one line, submenu j dot onclick equals submenu onclick func. And um, not only does it make it more readable, like you'll notice that here it, it has to indent quite far um, in, in order to get through all that nested logic, but also it makes it, more importantly, it makes it more correct because um, when you're dealing with event handling functions, it's very important that you're only dealing with one function in memory and not creating a thousand functions. Um, each function has an instantiation cost. So if you instantiate a thousand functions, you have, to, you have to do that each time. Also, there's no predictability about events. Um, I could get into exotic examples that have to do with timed delays and maybe with things moving around, but um, you'll have to take my word for it or watch his videos because he gives a good example of it as well. Um, so this is, in general, the way that he wants you to do it, and it's a, it's a good idea. Declare all your variables at the top of the function, um, then, um, and then initialize each of your variables. Here, um, the, one of our variables is a function that needs to be initialized with this function, and then go into the logic of, of the function itself. So at this point, um, I want to take a step back and, uh, and just run you through some slides from a presentation that Crockford made a few years ago. This is for um, UE Theater. So we're just going to run through the quick syntax and some of the pitfalls and some of the examples of, um, of JavaScript. Again, this is by Douglas Crockford. These are his slides. He gets into a lot of really kind of esoteric examples that we will not get into here, but these are some, uh, you know, some abridged selections from some slides that he's done before. Um, so uh, JavaScript has good parts. We'll get to them later. Right now we're going to kind of talk about the bad parts, which come from legacy, good intentions, and haste. Haste because it was developed really fast. And um, so with numbers, there's no integer types. So immediately, and immediately with the integer type, um, if, you're, if you're dealing things with money, you'll have to um, be aware that uh, there's going to be some rounding because there's floating point math all over the place. Of course, it is 64-bit floating points. Um, so you, you, can, you can achieve a level of precision with it, but everything is based off of approximations, and that becomes problematic in certain points. Um, for example, uh, the associative law does not hold because of the slight bits of rounding that happen with the floating point representations of the numbers. So this actually produces false for some numbers of ABC, even though Mathematically, it's not a false statement. So uh, decimal fractions are approximate. That is actually false here. Um, uh, in JavaScript, there's a math object. And when we talk about objects in JavaScript, um, we use dot notation in order to access the member 
methods. So in here, you would do math.sqrt and then pass in parameters in order to get to the square root function. So be aware that if you want to use any of these functions, you have to pre prefix it with that math, uh, math object name stored in a global variable and then the dot operator. And again, this is you know, an example of how fragile the, the global uh, namespace is. If some uh, you know, malicious JS were to override the math variable and replace it with its own contents, maybe they could even manipulate your code if they knew that you were using and relying on those functions. Um, so uh, that's an example of how to call a math function. Um, NAN, you, you'll see this inside of your debugging. This, is, this stands for not a number. And um, it's the result of erroneous operations. Uh, so um, if you do a 1 divided by 0, um, then you'll get NAN. Um, I, the, uh, it's toxic, so any arithmetic operation with that, that produces this result will also uh, have NAN as a result. Um, so that means that if you add 1 to 1 divided by 0, then the result of that will also be NAN, not a number. Um, but here are some other bad parts. NAN is not equals 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 NAN, um, which is very strange. Um, and even stranger, not a number, number is not equals equals NAN. So the difference here between equals 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 and equals equals is that the first um, does not involve type coercion. It's strict equality. Um, but the second does allow type coercion. And by type coercion, I mean that um, you can, in certain cases, treat strings like numbers. And in other cases, you can treat them as strings. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. So um, in order to test equality with strings, use equals equals equals. Um, <coughs> Plus can mean concatenate two strings or it can mean add. So here, the string dollar sign plus the string one plus the string two equals the string dollar sign one two. Um, and it's equivalent to using the concat function. And here you'll see uh, this string that's contained in these. Uh, in, in between these two single quotes, that is actually accessible as an object using the dot notation. And it has the concat function as a, a method of that object. Everything in functions, or everything in, object, uh, in uh, JavaScript is uh, an object slash, slash function. Um, so in order to convert a number to a string, you can call. Um, to string on the number, because numbers are objects. Um, there's this interesting operator, the plus. If you put plus in front of um, the string 1, like plus 1, then that actually turns this into the number 1. Um, or if, uh, sorry, if Var contain if a variable contains an, uh, a string and it it's um, used uh, and it's used with the plus operator, then you can it, you can in coerce it into a number by uh, using typecasting facilities. Um, you can also use the parsint, uh, the global parsint function, um, where you pass in a string and then you um, specify uh, the you um, specify the the radix. Um, every string has a length property. This is much like arrays. Arrays have a length property as well. This contains a number that's equivalent to the length of the string. Um, extended characters are counted as two. So that means that if you have a Unicode character um, like umlaut u or something. Um, 
then that will actually uh, give you a, a count of two for one character if it's a, you know, a multi-byte character. So for arrays, um, arrays inherit from objects. So arrays are also objects. They also have a length property, which allows you to loop through them as we saw before. In order to do an array literal, um, you use the square brackets. This is much like um, some other languages. You have to put commas in between the different items. And then um, new items can be appended um, by doing the uh, by, by including an, L, uh, an index that's outside of the array. So the thing that's really kind of nefarious about arrays is that indexes are actually converted to strings and used as names for retrieving values. Um, this is really strange. Um, the, uh, you can run into some problems with it. Um, it's not like a Java array or something where um, if you uh, the, the uh, if if you remove an index from the middle of the array, you'll literally have an array with a hole in it, because those are string keys um, to those values, unlike say a Java array. Um, so uh, array methods have uh, these are some array methods, the, and because these belong to the array object. You can have an array in a variable and then just call dot splice or dot slice or dot sort. Um, so sort is very unusual uh, because it defaults to alphabetical ordering. And in alphabetical ordering, um, th this is actually the alphabetical ordering of these numbers. So be aware that even if you put um, even if you put numbers in and you call sort, then uh, they'll sort out of order unless you actually you know, do sort and then pass in this function that returns a number that's either greater than 0, equal to 0, less than 0, in order to indicate which is greater than which. Um, so that's part of, the, part of the bad elements, I guess, of JavaScript, those funky defaults. Um, here, if you do delete, a r delete is a keyword, and if you s say uh, delete array and then three in an array that's five indices long, then now you have a hole in the numbering. And if you try to loop through it, you'll actually encounter an error at that point. Um, but array.splice will remove the element and renumber all the following elements, which is pretty inefficient. Um, so use objects when the names are arbitrary strings. Um, and use arrays when the names are sequential integers. Uh, the, uh, they're very similar in JavaScript. Um, in JavaScript, uh, the simplest object is two curly braces. In JavaScript, the simplest array is two square braces. Um, and you can have objects that contain arrays and you can have arrays that contain objects, as we'll see when we get into JSON in a little bit. Um, unlike a lot of lang languages, regular expressions, um, which is a special sub-language that's designed for searching strings, um, they're actually a type in JavaScript. And um, you actually indicate them with the slash on the end and the slash on the beginning. So you can literally say, uh, ver foo equals slash star dot or uh, dot or you know php dot star slash and then semicolon. You don't have to put it in strings like um, some other languages. So um, in JavaScript, things aren't typeless, everything is loosely typed, um, but all of these values are kind of falsy. Um, and uh, so if you, put, if you put each of these things inside of an if statement, it will uh, not execute. And uh, so these operators are equals and not equals, and they can do type coercion which means that they can convert 
strings into numbers or uh, vice versa based off of what JavaScript thinks is best. You can learn those intricate rules of when the type coercion happens, or you can do like um, Douglas Crawford suggests and just use these all the time, which do not use type coercion. And the reason why you should do that is because type coercion in JavaScript is evil. Uh, because here is an empty string, equals equals zero, that is false. But z the number zero equals equals empty string is true. And even worse, the number zero equals equals the string zero is also true. So this is totally bizarre. Um, co type coercion is, is truly pretty weird. And I, I uh, ask you to please stay away from it by using the non-type coercing um, operators. So all values in, P in uh, JavaScript are objects, except for null and undefined. Null is a value that isn't anything, and undefined is a value that isn't even anything. Uh, <laughs> it's so weird that they have both of these keywords, and it has to do with this structure of variable hoisting that happens in JavaScript. Um, and undef undefined is basically the default values for all variables and parameters that haven't been assigned a value. And it's, in fact, the value of missing members in objects. So if I have, you know, var m equals the simplest object, and then I want to access m.foo, which hasn't been uh, accessed, de declared yet, um, th this is undefined at that moment, um, which is different than null, because null is something that, it's like a, it's funny to think of it this way, but it's actually a positive statement. It's saying this is not anything. Um, and undefined just means it hasn't been defined yet. Um, so I, I put this in because uh, JavaScript also has a switch, um, a switch statement. Um, so that's most of the bad parts. Getting on to functions, there are two ways of declaring functions in JavaScript. Uh, the, there are function statements and function expressions. This um, describes function expressions. This little part right here is a function expression. The, this is what we saw before in when we declared a function anonymously and inserted it inside the onClick handler of that A uh, element. Uh, function expressions have the function keyword followed by an optional name and then um, you know, maybe some parameters, like x here is passed in as a parameter. Note that you don't have to do var x or string x. There's no type checking that's done. So you just name whatever variables you want to pass in. And then the body has to be wrapped in curly braces and contain zero or more statements. That's a function expression. A function expression produces an instance of a function object. So the result of this is that an instance of a function object is inserted into this variable, add one. Um, function objects are first class, which means that they can be passed as an argument into a function. They can be returned from a function. They can be assigned to a variable, like we did here. We assigned the function into the, to be stored inside that variable. And it can be stored inside an object or array. That's what it, mean, that's what it means to be a first class uh, entity in computer science. A function statement, on the other hand, is like this. So um, you have the function keyword, and then you have this label for the function. And um, these are something that you can do, but it's a little bit deceptive. And, Java, and Crockford recommends that you actually kind of move away from this and go more toward the expression syntax. And the reason why is because function foo, with no parameters and an empty body, expands to variable foo equals function foo with a, a, a 
with no parameters and no body. And this in itself expands to variable foo equals undefined, and then foo equals function foo. So this is really just a long, complicated way of, um, of performing a function expression. Like, why didn't you just make a variable foo and store an anonymous function in it? Uh, it's, it's a little bit deceptive to do it this way. And it's really some syntactic sugar to help persuade people who use classical languages like Java or C++ to, to use JavaScript. Um, so when they say the assignment of the function is hoisted, this is one of the most misunderstood things about JavaScript. And it's, it can, it'll really trip you up in your, um, in your assignments if you're not aware of it going into it. Be aware that when you start to get some bugs, uh, that have to do with variables being assigned values and you don't understand why because it's inconsistent with PHP and C++ and Java and other languages that you've used. It's because um, in JavaScript um, we have function scope and not block scope. Um, so I, here I just wanted to reinforce this one where you put uh, an anonymous function inside a variable, that's a function expression. Here, where you uh, say function add one, this is a function statement. This is the one we, I don't want you to use. This is the one I do want you to use. Um, so a, a var statement declares and initializes a variable within a function. Um, a variable declared anywhere within a function is visible everywhere within the function. This is the thing that really trips people up that come from other languages. Because um, if you have um, var x equals function, and you have some code here, var x, var y equals 2, var x equals 3, Ver, even though there's code here, uh, x is actually available inside this code. Because what happens behind the scenes is that this part moves all the way up to the beginning of the function, and there's implicitly this ver x, y, and then you're left with y equals 2 and x equals 3, and x is actually valid as a variable inside all the entire body of the function. And that includes functions that are nested within functions. So um, that's why Crockford rep recommends that you declare all of the variables for the function right at the top, because technically that's what happens behind the scenes. So why not make it more clear? Um, so uh, declaring a var, um, it just expands it out into two declarations uh, where my var equals undefined and my other var equals undefined, and then the initialization happens. Um, so this function would work in Java. It would work in PHP. But in, in JavaScript, it doesn't work, because what happens is that there's not a new variable i here. The there's only one variable i, and it's hoisted up and declared right here and set to undefined. And then um, it's overwritten. It'll, this, this program will run forever. It will not terminate because i is not redeclared here. Um, so uh, that's why you should always hoist your variables you know, as a preventative measure. Um, so declare all your variables at the top of the function, and declare all functions before you call them. The language provides mechanisms that allow you to ignore this advice, but they are problematic. Um, so this is also problematic. Um, so if you leave off a semicolon, JavaScript will actually insert it for you automatically. If you were to leave the semicolon off here, JavaScript would be like, oh, he, he meant semicolon. And semicolon means that that's the end of a statement. Um, unfortunately, um, the semicolon isn't always inserted in the right place, and it isn't, doesn't exactly do what you want. So you have to be really careful not to omit those uh, semicolons. So besides variable hoisting, 
the value of the this variable is probably the single most confusing thing about JavaScript. Um, so the this parameter contains a reference to the object of invocation. What that means is that well, um, the object, when it's actually ev invoked, when it's actually ran in the browser, this is the keyword this is very different depending on where it is uh, instantiated. So in general, this allows a method to know what object it is concerned with. Uh, and it's a, it allows a single function to service many functions. It, you know, it, it is really important. Um, it's the key to making big structures. Um, things like uh, Gmail wouldn't be possible without the this keyword. Um, as we saw at the very end of lecture, the um, parentheses suffix operator surrounding zero or more comma separated arguments um, will invocate whatever comes before it. And by invocate, we mean execute. Um, if a function is called with too many arguments, the extra arguments are just thrown out. If a function is called with too few arguments, the missing values will be set to undefined because everything is set to undefined until it's set a value in JavaScript. And there is no implicit type checking of the arguments like there is in Java. So there are a few, there are four ways to call a function. Um, there's the function form where um, you have an actual function that you're evoking, like, um, like uh, let's see, what's a good example? Um, well, like, like any function that you define on your own um, in global scope. Um, and there's, the method form where you're actually calling it as it's it's called a method rather than a function because a method refers to an object that that opens it it um, or or that it belongs to a method is a function that um, has references to properties and uh, variables that that situate its context. Um, so this is actually the most common name. So like math.sqrt is the method form. When, this function, when a function is called in the method form, this is set to that big object. So inside the body of this function, the this keyword, it stands for the math object inside math.sqrt. Um, and this allows methods to have a reference to the object of interest, um, which is important because in the math object, they might have lots of constants. They might have a constant called pi. Um, in the function form, uh, the uh, you like like with uh, anonymous functions, then um, you have uh, well with some anonymous functions, uh, the uh, this, val th th this keyword is actually set to the global object. Um, and uh, if you make a function that's nested within a function, then uh, the inner function will actually have its own scope uh, and its own this keyword. And so in order to get access to the outer function's variables, you need to set uh, in the outer function, you need to set a variable that traps the this variable and, and make, it, make it available. So let me explain what I mean. If you have, um, uh, where outer equals function, um, Where uh, secret equals one, two, three, four, five. Where um, so um, in 
I, actually, this isn't a good example. Um, let's say that um, the I, uh, that this was, uh, let's say that we're talking about the, the on click handler before a dot on click equals function x. Um, the this element here contains a reference to that a document object in this scope. However, here the this variable contains a reference to, uh, to this function. So in order, to, in order to get access to the a document object, you need to say var that equals this. And then inside here, you can say uh, that dot class names. You know, you can, you can perform operations on that, that anchor document object inside of this function by making sure that this local scope doesn't clobber uh, the this variable, that you, this keyword that you need access to. Um, so um, this chart is really the key to, to understanding it. If it's called like math.sqrt, then inside that, the this object contains a reference to the math object. Um, if it's called in uh, a function format, like where you just call the name of the function, then it, this actually contains a reference to the global object, or it's undefined, depending on the version of JavaScript. Um, if you uh, instantiate a function using a, the new, uh, new keyword, then you actually get inside this object um, the new object. And uh, we won't talk about apply. Um, but this can actually change a lot about the, the way that JavaScript is done. Um, so um, let me just say a, mo a thing about closure, and then we'll talk about jQuery really fast. Um, so the context of an inner function includes the scope of the outer function. In this function that's inner, you are also inside the scope of the outer. So if we had a, a ver foo here, you'd be able to reference foo inside this function. The inner function enjoys that context even after the parent functions have returned. So that means that if, func if this function is executed, let's say the onclick happens, um, but do something as a function that occurs much later, much, much after the onclick event, then variables that were in this outer scope are still available to this function even in that much later time frame. Um, and that's key because this function closes over this function and makes it, um, makes it possible so that even when a, a function is like kind of disposed, it's not disposed, but when it goes away and will never be instantiated again, um, if there's a function that uh, can be called within it, uh, then uh, you are able to get access to the, any of the variables that were declared in the scope around it. Um, this is the power of JavaScript. This is like one of the best things about it. It's a quality that it gets from Lisp. Um, and if you go through the videos, you can see the, the language hierarchy and how it derives from Lisp and other languages with Clojure. Um, so here's a way to do um, a function that uses global scope. So this is a function that, that takes a number and returns the name of the number. You, you pass in nine and you get out the, the string nine. And names here is accessible inside this function because you have global scope. So alert digit name three will actually print out the word three. So that's global scope. Here's a way uh, to do that inside a function that's really slow. Um, you declare a function with a large array in it, and then you return the name's value. And it's slow because every single time you call the function, it allocates 
memory for this array again, um, which is a, a waste. Um, in closure, what happens is that here you see this parenthesis and this parenthesis. They're not required, but this, these two parentheses that are after the function, they are invoking this function immediately after it's declared. And he's put these extra parentheses around here in order to call attention to something special that's going on. What's happening here is that he makes an anonymous function and then instantly instantiates it. And so the function is gone after it's instantiated. And the result of it being instantiated is that what's stored inside digit name is a function. And that function itself has access to this variable that is stored in that scope that's closed over it. So this de gets declared once in memory. And uh, even though that function has closed after, the, after the, this variable digit name has been uh, initialized, even though that function is closed, those variables are, are accessible to this function uh, that's then stored inside digit name because it's returned as a first class object. Um, so this is the special thing about, uh, about closure. And the, it enables you to do things like this. So um, here you have a uh, variable DOM, uh, which stands for an element that you, you, you call get element by ID. If you know uh, that you have like um, div ID equals 327, um, then you can say document .get element by ID 327 and it will return a reference to this div element in DOM in the document object model. And then he also makes a uh, variable level equal to one. And these are variables that will be available after this function has been executed. And inside of this function, he, he um, makes an, a function called step that um, basically uh, set this this function set timeout is something that is available in JavaScript. You pass in a function and then a number of milliseconds for it to wait before executing it again, and it only executes it once. Um, but here the step function says call me 100 milliseconds later. And level up here is set to 1, and level is incremented by 1. And it says if level is less than 15, then execute it 100 milliseconds later. later. And um, so h here is set to the, the string of the um, uh, of the level amount, so it's one, two, three, four, five, and it's set in two string um, in base uh, base sixteen, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think it's it must be in base sixteen, um, and uh, then they're able to actually. Um, um, FFFF is um, for R and G, and then the H and the H will actually be um, be the the blue code, um, and so they're setting the background color of the element to be an ever lighter and lighter blue value. It starts out pretty dark, and then it gets lighter and lighter until it becomes FFFFFFF. And uh, because this level variable is available to this step function even after this function has closed, then what, what happens is that when you call fade ID, then it will fade really gradually over you know, 16 steps um, to white. Um, that's the kind of thing that cl closure lets you do. So. Um, the 
uh, jQuery is a library uh, that uh, operates on the principle that you can store an object inside a variable with a name that's a single character. And in jQuery, that character is the dollar sign. So in jQuery, uh, which is a library that you have to load, anytime you put the dollar sign, you can then put a dot and then call a function name that is built into that library. So let's take a look at the jQuery version of the, um, of the same PHP directory. And um, you can see that we have a nice sliding effect. And it has the same kind of thing, but now it slides up and slides down. And this sliding facility is probably done with closure just in the fade manner that we were talking about using set timeout. Um, so let's take a look at the code. First of all, I'll uh, look at the view. Um, oops. So um, I highly recommend that you uh, y you are able to go to the jQuery site and download a file called uh, jQuery.js and then include it uh, in your your JavaScript directory and include it just the same way you'd include your own JavaScript. Uh, you can do that. However, um, there are several advantages to doing it this way. Uh, Google offers as a service. Um, Uh, these libraries. There are several of them. It's not just jQuery. Um, there's Dojo, Moo Tools, Prototype. And uh, if you look down at jQuery, they give you this nice path. And if you do the .min.js one, that's the minimized version, so it'll be a very small amount of code. And the advantage to having Google do this is that there are a number of servers distributed throughout the country that Google maintains. And because JavaScript files are public files, uh, you, and if you hit it once, then you hit it again within uh, the caching period of your browser. It actually will download it from the closer server than from the farther server. And also, it will download it onto your own machine if it's from the same domain. So the idea is that Google is so common, people Google, it, Google things all the time, that um, if everyone uses the same source for J jQuery, it'll result in faster response times for everyone. And they're, they're very kind, kind to do these things. It, it's, it's kind, but also they get something out of it too because they're able to get demographics about who's using each of the libraries and uh, make decisions based off of that. So this is all it takes to include jQuery. Now let's take a look at the actual script itself. Uh, you can see it's a lot smaller. This is the entire code required to do the same thing. Um, here you'll see the dollar sign object. Um, every you know every uh, object is a is a function. So we're passing into the dollar. Uh, the dollar sign variable contains a function that can be invoked with a parameter. And um, if we pass in the document, the variable containing the document object, then we'll, we, it will return a value that's accessible via a, uh, a dot operator here that we'll be able to actually um, call a ready function on. So what this first line does is um, this uh, gets called only when the entire document is ready for JavaScript to operate on it. Basically, when the entire document object of the page has uh, finished flowing out, then it calls 
this anonymous function inside here. And um, the, one of the notable things about jQuery is that you can use what's called CSS selectors. So um, if you go inside here, you'll see PFT directory um, and PFT file tree are a class. Well, in CSS, you, you select a class with dot and then the name. So selecting dot PHP file tree um, selects every object with a class equal to PHP file tree. And then it returns that um, jQuery object with that array of document objects inside of it. And because it's a jQuery object that's returned, you can continue to call jQuery methods on it, such as find within that array UL items. And UL items are like this. Uh, and you know, if you had a nest, deep nested structure, you'd have more UL items. And you'd hide them. So if I, if I restart this, that's this very first thing. It hides all of the subdirectories that are represented by UL elements. And then it finds all of the A elements that are children of elements that have a class of PFT directory. And it registers an event that happens when you click it, equal to this anonymous function. And uh, this is great. You can find the parent of the object that is clicked on. This contains a reference to the, um, the object in question, in this case, the document object that represents the thing clicked on. So when I click on this, the this variable actually contains the document object model for that element right there. And within it, it finds this CSS selector ul colon first is the very first unordered list. And jQuery has this nice method slide toggle with an adjustable speed um, that um, basically unfurls the children elements. And, um, So jQuery has great documentation. Um, you can see that one of the parameters you can uh, pass in is the duration. And another one is callback. You could uh, pass in a function that it would execute when the, when the slide is done. And the slide they're talking about is that slide right there. And you can even see how it uses overflow equals hidden and then the height equal to these floating numbers. And it adjusts it you know, using a millisecond delay in order to make it look like it's unfurling, like it's sliding open. And um, basically, um, if the attribute of the parent is PFT directory, then you r return false. I mean, that's, uh, that's the entire functionality. Um, all of the clicking functionality is put in there by the PHP, actually. Um, so that's not provided by the jQuery. Um, jQuery is very, you know, very easy to uh, get advanced functionality. And the, the uh, function that you're probably using most often in coming assignments is um, JSON or, um, or AJAX. JSON is actually an alias to the AJAX method in jQuery. JavaScript object notation is, um, oh, we just barely didn't get to that slide. Let, let's get to it. So um, this is the syntax of JavaScript object notation. Um, you, uh, you can have um, brackets. And within brackets, you can have a value separated optionally by a comma. And a value can be a string, number, object, array, true, false, or null. And uh, so um, you can encapsulate an entire JavaScript object with this, um, with this syntax. Um, and uh, in fact, the, um, the function uh, parameters here, you know, they, they follow this JavaScript object notation itself. 
Um, and uh, so JavaScript object notation is a data interchange format. And there's a great uh, uh, JSON encode function in PHP that um, takes an array um, or an object. Like here's an associative array where the letter A goes to 1, the letter B goes to 2, so, so and so forth. And it says JSON encode array. And it returns an object with this uh, curly brackets here. And you see the string A has a colon and then the value 1 and then a comma. And so this is an object with a parameter A equal to 1, a parameter B equal to 2. Um, because, uh, because this function exists and is supported in PHP, um, we're able to construct an entire data structure and then call JSON and code and then actually embed it in our JavaScript. And uh, it embed it in our JavaScript programmatically before it is actually uh, received by the recipient. Um, and uh, in order to see an example of that, uh, we'll get into this more next week with, uh, um, with Ajax. But um, for this week, um, I've included some examples from last year. Um, open cycle map. Uh, and this is a, just a simple example where this is a tile f from a map um, f that uh, has a certain name representing its um, latitude and a certain or a certain number representing its latitude and a certain uh, uh, number representing its longitude. And when you call and when you hit these buttons, then if you're listening on the network, you can see that when you go west, uh, it calls um, a, the URL with these functions. You can see zoom equals 15, and x equals 9910, and y equals 1211. Uh, and um, the, uh, the result um, is it returns the um, directory of or it returns the file name of this image. And um, the, uh, you, you can um, assemble a very large amount of data and then actually echo it inside the header of your document and evaluate it in JavaScript in order to pass that data directly into JavaScript and be able to access it with the dot syntax you're used to for the objects. Um, so that, that'll be more for next week because it has more to do with um, Ajax. But feel free to play around with these examples. Um, you can uh, see how it goes north and south and east and west. And each time this downloads, it would be impolite to hit the tile server that serves these up more than once. So actually what it does is it downloads the appropriate tile, caches it in a folder on the server, and then subsequent hits to that image are restored from the cache. So you'll notice if I go north and south, and then north, and then north takes a little bit longer. And now if I go south and north, it's nice and fast again. That's because now it's cached on the server. Um, and this is a style that you'll be using um, in the upcoming assignment because you'll have to um, be getting certain information about companies from CS75 Finance, caching it on your server, and uh, not hitting that external API more than you need to. Um, so I thank you for your attention. This has been a lot of stuff. I highly encourage you to use JSLint and to watch some of the Crockford videos. Um, if you were to just watch two videos, or if you were to just watch one video, watch Function the Ultimate, and skip through all the parts where it seems like you're not understanding anything. And um, if you were to watch two vi videos, watch these two. Um, and uh, they're basically kind of an overview of the, the syntax, the good parts, the bad parts, and uh, what you can do with closure. Uh, so I thank you for your attention. And uh, let us know at the CS50 Discuss if you have any questions. 
And if you have any questions about my code in particular, um, feel free to email me personally.